grab a copy of The Willows that you've just narrated for us. And it's brilliantly, I might add. I, yeah. I don't oh, think anybody could have done it better than you did. It was good. It was really good. All my life, I have been strangely, vividly conscious of another region. Not far removed from our own in one sense. Yet wholly different in kind. Where great things go on unceasingly. Where immense and terrible personalities hurry by. Intent on vast purposes. Compared to which earthly affairs, the rise and fall of nations, the destinies of empires, the fate of armies and continents, are all as dust in the balance. Vast purposes, I mean, that deal directly with the soul. Gary Adkins, how are things in Springfield, Illinois? Very, very good. It's a little bit overcast today. It's not a lovely day, but it doesn't have snow or extreme cold. It's kind of war warm here for winter. In fact, we've had a good warm winter all, all the way, which I like, but kind of worries me, you know, big picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It could mean that the, uh, every year. that the, the yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not good. It is nice, but it's not good. The thing is, having having been a visitor as a tourist to Springfield, Illinois, I can tell you that if anyone's fancying visiting, it's not the kind of town that really does need excellent weather to make it cool. It's just a cool little place. It's uh, I like it. Um, uh, That's I true. Really it's more like of a, it. you know, it's a nice little uh, town for um, public, you know bars and things like the meat restaurants and it's, it's a nice place to get together with friends and it's also you know, I think, the, ho the home of abraham lincoln and i'm sorry what you were going to yeah. what were you going to say you're going to say getting together oh, with I, friends oh I, I was just going to say um i did that for for the super bowl and uh you know i i love that i love that i mean i had some couple of shots of of your best uh scotch <laughs> over there <laughs> Glenn living is one of my favorite things and i had a little of that. And the Super Bowl was just super as a result. <laughs> Not a huge football fan. More, so where more did you watch it? I watched it at a little bar, a uh, neighborhood bar called the um, Barrel Head. Right. Two words. And it kind of, that's kind of an Irish bar. I mean, Irish yeah. owned. And um, yeah. Very, it, it had the top of the whole top of the bar blown off a few years ago and a tornado and it came back and it's, it's still in good shape i mean they had a, a good sized crowd there the the bar was rooting full on, was it the bar was full yeah and and they were rooting in on different directions one side was rooting for you know philadelphia yeah and they were disappointed i'm afraid but kansas city did play really better overall i mean so you would have had a good atmosphere in there with people rooting for both sides yeah, and, it was, and yet it was friendly because a lot of them were, this was their second favorite team they were rooting for and yeah. instead of the Packers or the Bears, which would have been the usual <laughs> in, in Springfield. It's, it's interesting because I used to go to radio conventions twice a year to the United States and, and went on various road trips because what I used to do is instead of flying to the city where the convention was, I would fly to a city miles away and drive to the convention. And... Um, so, for instance, if the if the convention was in New Orleans, I would fly to Memphis and then drive to New Orleans through Mississippi, you know, or or the one yeah. when I went to Springfield. Actually, the convention was in Chicago, so once again, I flew to Memphis and drove north. Um, that's and, the and way went to through, do it. Yeah, that's yeah, uh, that's that's because America is great for road trips. I find because the roads are wide and you don't have roundabouts and all the cars are automatic. Yeah. <laughs> it's and, actually and quite good. Even though, in, even, in Illinois in central Illinois, it's, it's not crowded either. The roads are really, really pretty wide open. So you, you could go as, as fast as you want. <laughs> yeah. Well, we I'm even, sorry, we even, you, you know, ventured mm -hmm. onto old route 66 at one point on that one. Cause it, it goes, you know, yes, through that's there. a great idea. You know, there are some businesses that are, originating from Route 66, which went through Springfield. Um, like there's a cozy dog drive-in where the corn dog was invented, the, the wow. inventor of the corn dog. Oh, yeah. That business. It's still in business. It's, it's still it's there. A cool place to go for. Oh, yeah. no, we missed that. See, this... 
Yeah. It was a Dairy Queen. It used to have uh, ice cream, you know, uh, soft serve ice cream, and and I just loved it. It was a uh, hot fudge, was my favorite thing in those days. So, I mean, that so place I've got to go back and, and do that. But uh, well, getting back to yeah. the Super Bowl, on one of the trips, it was it was actually that one when we when we drove north and went through um, Springfield, is we were in Memphis on Super Bowl Sunday. And so I said to Julie, well, let's go out to, a, uh, it was the one, I forget who the teams were playing, but it was the one where the Rolling Stones were the halftime show. I don't remember that Oh, I that remember one. that, yeah. Right, it was that yeah. one. And um, so we went to this sports bar about 10 minutes before it kicked off, and it was empty. There was literally three people in there, and it wasn't a far off Beale Street. It was right in Memphis, and I'm like what the hell's going on here? So we ended up watching it at the bar in the hotel and there was a reasonable crowd in the hotel and it was really good and there was people there could tell us what was going on because we didn't understand all the rules and it was fine. And I said to these people, I said, well, why is the sports bar like two blocks from here? Wouldn't that, shouldn't this be one of their biggest nights of the year? What's the deal? And they said, well, I don't know about anywhere else in the US, but in the South there, Super Bowl Sunday is a family day and people watch it with their families at home. And so it's not necessarily a sports bar thing. So obviously you were in an Irish pub, so you did all right. But then all of a sudden it made sense to me when, it, when I realized it was a family thing, why the Janet Jackson wardrobe malfunction was such a big deal in America. Because if people yeah, are with right. their families and that goes on, because, you know, I right. think, like, if well, that happened at half time at a soccer game here and a night game, I don't think it'd be a big deal at all. It'd be talking point, yeah. but it wouldn't, a lot like... Of parties, it, a lot of parties taking place in the north, at, at least in, you know, this part of the country. Yeah. You know, people hold parties at their house or they go meet at a bar for, you know, to party, which yeah. I, I prefer because then nobody has to serve you. I mean, you, you know, none of the guests have to... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do any work. You can all just... Yeah, sit back yeah. on the bar stool. Plus, you haven't got family movie. members there that are going to cause an issue over something else that you did when you were 12 or something, you know, and they can't bring yes, that up. Exactly. Got, haven't got the background on you. That is. It's, although that's part of the joy of Christmas. It's, it's <laughs> something you don't want to replicate throughout the year. <laughs> we just yeah. got through that. And Especially when you just want to enjoy the game. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it was a really big screen. That's the other thing they've got at that place. And it's a common thing in sports bars up around the world, I'm sure. It's a, it's a huge screen. And it's like watching a movie. And you can see yeah. every detail. Of, and that's yeah. why I, I got down on the refs, uh, you know, about this terrible call that, that keeps happening where you have to go to the ground with the ball and, and retain possession if you make the catch in the end zone. You know, it doesn't matter if in, in running the ball into the end zone, as soon as the ball crosses the plane of the goal line, it's a touchdown. But in, you know, catching it, they have a completely different rule for that. You know, that so if a guy catches sense. it in the air and he drops down and, and falls to the ground, then that's not a touchdown? He has to catch it cleanly? It Is that the deal? He has to catch it and hold on to and maintain possession. In other words, they say it's not a catch even if it slips slips down you know it's kind of slipping down your body and you're trying to trap it against your body and you still kind of hold on you still got it at the end of the catch but yeah. they're saying oh that's not good enough I, I disagree i think they need to go back to the original rule which was the same as for running it in if you if you caught it and had a, you know possession and got a foot down at that instant yeah, it says, yeah that's what it should be yeah you know, yeah or two feet in yeah. the college game, it's, it's different. Oh, it's different so, in college football. So as long as yeah. you catch it, it's a touchdown. You don't have to keep yeah. hold of it and control it. It sounds um, like a similar that, rule for... I lived in Australia for a while, and in Aussie rules, which I still don't understand properly, but there's a part of the game, and it's called a mark. It means when a player jumps up and catches a ball cleanly and comes down with it anywhere on the field... Then he gets like a free kick. He can kick it any way he likes. So it's, it's taking a mark, oh, wow. and and it's a big that's, deal. And the reason why I rem why I remember that is because the radio station I worked at, which was Five SE in Mount Gambia in South Australia, they used to take a game every Saturday afternoon, a live commentary of a game, 
from a it was a fa- feed from a Melbourne radio station, and it was a very famous commentator who I think for some reason has been disgraced now because of some scandal. But anyway, this this I think I, I don't know for sure. So if he hasn't, I apologise to him. The the guy's name is Rex Hunt, and he was he also was he used to have a fishing show as well, which is typical Australia. He's the football commentator, but he also does a fishing TV show. He used to kiss the fish when he catch them. Anyway. I was listening one day to this game and this player jumps up to get a mark and they're jumping literally from the ground, you know, just there's no (laughs) springboard or anything. And Rex Hunt shouts, he was higher than Joe Cocker at Woodstock. (laughs) It's one of the best bits of sports commentary I've ever heard. Higher than Joe Cocker at Woodstock. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> One observation: Why pick on Joe Cocker? Though there were quite a few. Artists well, exactly. Who were yeah, high. yeah. There was about half a million people there. Um, they were like that by all accounts. I wasn't there, but I've seen I've seen the movie a few times. <laughs> it's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. That is that is a good. There's a there's a great a, scene in the old movie. sitcom in the old sitcom Taxi, where the the burnt out hippie Jim. Um, he starts talking about Woodstock and they're asking him, oh, wow, you were there? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And this was going on and there's there's people uh, swimming in the lake naked and there was poetry and there was this going on and this going on. And they're like, and Jim, what about the music? And Jim went like, there was music? (laughs) 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 Oh, dear. It's so good. good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so and, and so Springfield, home of um, Abraham Lincoln. So I went to his tomb yeah. when I visited, but I didn't go to his home. But you you worked in Abe's old home, didn't you? Tell me yeah, about that. I, I regret it. I, I forgot to bring that up the last time I was on your show. Uh, he, <laughs> You know, he, there are things in the house of him, like uh, the death mask and in the kitchen of all places. Wow. That's in the kitchen. And also, uh, uh, there's a plaster bust of his hand, you know, in death with holding a um, object. I think probably to to make it easier to extract the hand the hand mold. But uh, anyway, uh, also his hat is one of his. I think he only had three or four of those, you know, stovepipe hats. Well, that's in there too. So, and that's just around the corner from where I was. I was installing carpeting with my father. My father did this pretty regularly because they get over a million visitors a year in the house. So so the main traffic area has a carpet that has to be re- replaced pretty good, which is good good for me because I got to actually work in there with no one in there. They gave us the keys and we went in there, you know, the two of us to install the carpeting. And in while in there, I did see something out of the corner of my eye just just around the corner into the kitchen i i saw a movement and i could have sworn it was abraham lincoln it looked it looked but of course i'm i'm an imaginative guy imagination <laughs> is is my game <laughs> now yeah. anyway but so, that's cool um, though but, honest abe could have been just saying okay nice carpet thank you boys like it yeah <laughs> <laughs> and there's a there's a famous poem by Rachel Lindsay, who's from Springfield, that was about Abraham Lincoln walks at midnight, and he was actually basing that on his own, you know, observation that he had seen a fig a Lincoln figure walking, you know, and he lives very close to where Lincoln's home is, and actually right across from the governor's mansion is is was the Rachel Lindsay house, and it's still there. It's a house that. Lincoln visited quite often because it, it was a relative's house, right? Like his uh, brother-in-law's house. Wow! And so anyway, yeah, kind of cool. <laughs> so, I, so I wish this, I could ha, ha, having this kind of imagination and this fascination is this is this why you are putting out? classic ghost stories as books these days is there is there any connection I think I was, there I, I think i was already uh, liking that kind of tale but i think it only encouraged me <laughs> to go further <laughs> down that road yes uh, yeah and i like this tv show called ghosts 
from Britain. Okay. That you, yeah. I like the Brit, the British version. They have an American version of the same series. Yeah. Not as good. Yeah, but it's is that the Actually, one? the BBC is behind that too. Is that the Go one ahead. with Derek Akora, or is that that's an older one? I'm thinking I might be thinking. No, of a I different think that's one. an older one. Yeah. Okay. But right. it's it's good stuff, and actually, yeah. I do think I don't think that our energy ever goes away when we die. I think there's got there's bound to be some some place it goes, whether into a multiverse, the next universe, or over or something. But I mean, I just do feel that that's that only makes sense. It doesn't. You know, everything in the universe is, it's known basic law of physics that energy continues. It, it can't, yeah, it be, can't destroyed. be destroyed. It can't no, it only changes its form, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I'm just saying that that's a physical explanation for it, but I think there is a metaphysical one as well. So, yeah. Something to well, chew on. But we're, yeah, I've got a book, a couple of books out of ghost stories now that are actually not mine. I'm just no, but you've get... you've um, you've condensed them and yes, I condense them and try to put them into a, a good form for an audio book. And well, they none they more so than the willows are well, are the willows together. is 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 a wonderful book that we've. It's the second audio book we've done together. It's by Algernon yes. Blackwood. Um. A great broadcaster, I might add. Yes, and I found that out. I didn't know, but I've since I've since done some research, and he was uh, he was a BBC radio broadcaster and narrator too. Back before there were audio books, he was reading books on the radio, and he's wonderful. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he, he is, and uh, I encourage everyone to find out more about him and actually, you know, get some of those old recordings and listen to him. Or the more inexpensive way to do this would be to grab a copy of The Willows that you've just narrated for us, and it's brilliantly, I might add. I, yeah. I don't oh, think anybody could have done it better than you did. It was good. It was really good. Graham. Oh, thank, thank you, you for that. Well, I enjoyed, dude. I enjoyed the last one, too. But it's just the story yeah, like is that. written so well and... You really get the feeling of, because you know something's going on, but you don't know what. You know, these, these guys exactly. are out there, they're, they're camping, and but there's something going on. And uh, yeah. it really is well put together. And I know, Black, you know, Blackwood a lot of that is Algin on Blackwood, but some of it's got to be a bit of you as well, Gary, because you're condensing it and, and bringing the bits to life that you want. Yeah. Well, I was an editor for 30 some years in the newsletters uh, for the school board association, Illinois schools, public schools, um, which are the opposite of public schools in your country. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. <laughs> as yeah. far as what they are. I'm just trying to clarify that. But anyway, I, I think, you know, I, I care about what other people write as much as I write what I write myself. If, if more, actually, because, I mean, there's a lot more good stuff out there and i love that particular story it's, it's one of the best in the english language and actually um a famous horror writer hp lovecraft said it is the best supernatural story in in english as far as he knows the willows is. he wrote a yeah. thesis yeah he wrote a long thesis about the horror and the supernatural um and what makes it work in literature very good um hypothesis on his part but anyway he he said the willows is the best and actually he kind of emulated it in a lot of his stories he created something called the cthulhu mythos and it's a lot of that is based on this same basic idea as the willows which is that there's uh an outside influence are they aliens we don't we don't really know if they're aliens in the willows but it is it is some other gods maybe uh, from a neighboring universe is, is what it looks like <laughs> yeah. now especially with the multiverse theory which i referred to before but can't help going back to that that is kind of the predominant belief among scientists now that there are you know more than one universe operating simultaneously side by side you might say yeah yeah and there's yeah. been a there's been a lot written about it and proper scientists 
I mean, I did an audio book on uh, the the multiverse, and it was from a scientist, and uh, he was finding he was finding that using a virtual reality was helping him understand how it could how it could be, you know, virtual reality headsets, you know, like um, yeah, yeah. So, so these, I mean, so these books now. Then, I mean, how they'd be just as relevant now as when it was written, The Willows, wouldn't it? Then, just as it, it relevant. It would be more so, probably more so. I mean, it, because of that, because the, there is a, an explanation to it all uh, a little bit now. That makes that really describes what goes on in The Willows to some degree. I mean, you would have just thought it was totally metaphysical, which also explains it. But you know, this gives you another possible explanation for and you know he really did um, encounter wilderness areas a lot it blackwood actually was a farmer in canada for a long time i mean i'm saying a couple decades i think early in his his lifetime um he had he wore a lot of hats he did a lot like me i mean he did a lot of different stuff and i th i think he's a really cool guy i think he did some really good uh, narration too i mean he was Yes. We should remember people who do great narration, I, I believe. I think it's uh, a high calling because it's, it's part of the oral tradition. When I was in school, I studied Beowulf, and, and that was the, the beginning in English of, of that type of thing where you, you tell important stories or stories that have some resonance to people. And I think this is a story that stands up as, as good as any. It, when was it I really written? do. I really think it's do you, do you know when it around was, it was? Again, again, this one was around the turn of the century, I think, 1900 right. or so. So it's it's pretty old, but it also, that the language of it is very, very uh, modern. He doesn't, yes. yeah. doesn't seem to rely on a, a well, lot of Well, I don't of, think uh, there's Latin anything in it that dates it. it. It's all, everything's relevant. Yeah. People go camping, people go in the wilderness. People take canoes oh, and go up rivers and stuff. This all goes on now. Canoe uh, trip in, in yeah. uh, up the Danube, down the Danube, uh, rather, um, and where they get into it. There is actually a, an area in the Danube that ha has willow islands, just like is described in this story. And it goes on for miles, like 50 miles. I've seen photos of it, and it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. It's a monoculture that happens probably just because it is a – and, you know, a kind of a foreboding place. And yeah. the little sand yeah. islands form and tear and apart. You hear the wind the going and, through the willows. And, the and yeah. Through all the time. It's just, it's pretty frightening the way it's described in this book. <laughs> it, it adds it's great. a lot. <laughs> the yeah. physical world is, is a, I mean, he does a good job of describing it too. I, I've been camping yeah. and they, just being on any, you know, forlorn area is pretty frightening. Yeah. You know, that you don't run into that a lot in, in London or where you're from or <laughs> no. in Chicago, or even St. Louis. I mean, it's just, there's, there aren't any areas like that. Yeah. In most yeah. of the world today. But yeah, you, you could encounter them if you go camping. <laughs> yes. Like I, I yeah say that in Illinois, there's a, a very nice camping area in southern Illinois called the Shawnee National Forest, which is almost untouched. It's pristine. It's a national forest, and it can't be messed with. Thank God. I think we need more of those kind of areas, you know, yeah. that yeah. are just nature the way it used to be, the way it always was. Just yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So yeah. how does it work then when you republish a classic book are there do you have to get permissions or oh, how yes does that you all would work? you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to probably because i think they're pretty full up with editions of classic works but i, I had done this as a blogger before i had issued uh, the willows it's, it's in the public domain of course being such yes. an old story yeah and i rewrote it i really this is very extensively rewritten this is if you compare it side by side with the original story by Algernon and Blackwood, it, you'd find it's really condensed a lot. Yeah. And I, I tried to make it uh, is less repetitious, which works better for narration. And uh, the repetition works in the written word. If you're reading the story, I would re I would suggest reading it in 
Algernon Blackwood's original version. But if right. you're listening to an audio book, I think it needed to be revised a little to, to make yes. it more gripping and, and yeah. to the point. So yes. I, I hope that everyone will enjoy it. It's about an hour, I think, isn't it, it Cram? Yeah, you, around about up? that, I think. Yeah, I yeah. think it's, it's, not, it's not a long book, but j no. j to say that it's not a short book, there's plenty in it. There's lots going yeah, on in, in the time that's, and it moves, it, it's got a, it's got a pace to it, but it's not rushed. It's got a, you know, the stuff happening all the time. It's like every minute there's something just to yeah, make you yeah, go, exactly. hello, hello. And then, huh? and it kind of, I, I felt yeah, myself I reading it. I felt myself being drawn towards it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't want to give any of it away, but I do no, think I don't it's, do uh, but but I do think it's just full of, of amazing amazing happenings. You wouldn't expect you wouldn't really expect any of this stuff because it's not mundane. It's it's otherworldly. You're definitely facing the next world. You're you're facing something that is from beyond this earth. Yeah, it's and, great. It's called the Willows. It's by Algernon Blackwood. It's condensed by Gary Adkins. Or there's links in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put links in the description. I mean, I'm pointing to my website there, but actually in the description uh, on YouTube, there's links there to Amazon to uh, to download uh, the audio book. I, so I do encourage everyone to to at least listen to the that you get a free uh, you know go to the Amazon site and listen to the the little sample. It gives you like five minutes of it, I think, and it, you'll yeah. enjoy that. I think. <laughs> and then if you'll see if it's to your taste. That's my advice. Yeah, and check it out. Well, well, yeah. thank you very much, Gary. What's next for you then? Yes. What are, what are, you, what are well, you working on now? I just, I've got a couple things. One thing is I got my novel I wrote when I was in my 20s, and I've decided that it's a horror story. About, it's called The Horror at Creel Springs. Creel Springs is a real town in southern Illinois, and it, it takes place there, but it's an imaginative uh, little horror story. So I think people will enjoy that, but I've, right now I just had it, uh, oh, I Xeroxed the a copy to make it a little more white versus black on the page because it's kind of yellowed. <laughs> it was one of those, you know, it's in your door, desk drawer. It's know, been around altered. for a while. Wow. Yeah. 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 And I'm going to bring that and put it online because I really wanted to get it published originally, but it was very difficult to break in as an unknown writer in those days. So I got discouraged like most people and I put it away. But I, I actually had an agent for a while. I mean, I was close. I was this close to uh, <laughs> to getting it done then. And I'm going to get it done because I, luckily now anyone could publish a novel without too much trouble yeah. by going with independent Amazon. publishing the way it is it's a level playing field now yeah it is and i think that's how it probably was back in the you know 18th century i think there were it was fairly easy to get a book published because you know there, there were a lot of publishers and there weren't as many people who were you know literate and may, maybe <laughs> capable of writing something anyway i'm just i'm hoping that it will have an audience as well so uh, and then I've also got some other things. I got a new book of riddles out, which I, I bundled with my first book of riddles, and I put out as a, you know, 300 riddles instead of 160 each. <laughs> and actually, that's doing better. I, I think that's the length that is more embraced. So if you have a what, kid, the who bundle, wants, the bundle yeah. is doing better than the. So how was it? Was yeah. it a bundle of books? Is is that how it worked? Yeah, it's a bundle of two books under one cover instead yeah. of. Um, half the size i thought it was after i did the first one i thought this is too you know slim and it doesn't really compete well with the other books in this genre so let's put out 300 which is a pretty common you know number of riddles for a riddle book yeah so, <laughs> everyone who has a child who they want who's bright and wants to develop their brain power this is supposed to be one of the best things you could do is to play riddles with them Right. It's kind of an open-ended thing and, and get them thinking. And there's more than one answer, as you know. Of course. To most riddles. Yeah, yeah. and kids so. kids are really good at that kind of thing because their imaginations are still intact because they haven't been through the education system yet and had it knocked out of them. That's true. <laughs> that is a good point, Graham. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Although, although we all had teachers who we we love and know yeah. that they actually yeah. opened up our minds. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's kind of a trade-off going to school. You yeah. you, re- you live for that one or two teachers. My favorites are, yeah. are still, re- you know, living in my memory. Mrs. M- Mrs. Mander was my favorite grade school teacher, and I I want to say thanks to her because I would not be. <laughs> I would not be a success without her. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I'm glad you are a success. And thanks for choosing me uh, for mm-hmm. The Willows, which is the latest audio book we've done together. And uh, Gary Adkins, well, thank you. you so much. Best of luck. I enjoyed it, Graham. It's always good to talk to you. You're fine. And you too, my Take friend. Care. Thank you.